back in 2006, I was going to college and rooming with a guy who uh, just liked to tinker and he liked to fix things and make things. One day I came home from class and uh, he was building a catapult to shoot water balloons with. It was pretty impressive. The amount of knowledge that Jamie had about what a water balloon was capable of and seemed kind of surprised that this wasn't common knowledge. But I had no idea at the time how much of a water balloon was a part of Jamie's history and really his town's history. A small town in rural Alabama, a mining town, a mill town, had a water balloon fight every year since the 40s. So when I would tell people growing up, we used to have these water balloon battles every Halloween, the imagery that comes to mind is probably nowhere near reality. Kind of hard to explain to somebody the magnitude of the situation if you don't know. The authorities are involved. Parents are involved. There, there are grown-ups that are kids that night. Pickup trucks, trailers hooked to back of pickup trucks. Cold, honey, let me tell you, yes, freezing cold. If you weren't part of it, you know, who were you? Every town's got weird stuff to do. I've always known it was special that our little town did it. This town's always been known for, for being different, and they're always all in. Community spirit is definitely something this community does not lack. Well, if nobody ever has done that, they need to try it one time, yeah. I could say I participated till my kids were 15, 16, when they took it on themselves. <laughs> They didn't need daddy no more. Downtown, with everybody involved, that was a special night, you know, one time a year, and you couldn't duplicate it. My wife and I met in college, and I'll never forget her reaction the first time we talked about this. It was something like, well, where did you get your water balloons that you threw on Halloween? She's like, what are you talking about? You didn't throw water balloons at each other Halloween night? And she's like, no, what are you talking about? And it was the first realization I had of like, wait, were we the only ones that did that? And as a kid growing up, you thought it was the greatest thing ever. But you tell somebody outside, they're like, oh, man, y'all y'all did what? Yeah. I thought towns always let you do water balloon because I, I was raised doing that. You just assume it happens everywhere. I grew up believing every kid in America threw water balloons at each other on Halloween night. So my wife and I both do weeks of research found no evidence that it happened anywhere else. If this is true, Cordova, Alabama is the only city in the world where Halloween night was set aside for citywide water balloon warfare. So I decided to do what I thought would be a short documentary film about this crazy tradition. So I contact the local newspaper, hoping that somewhere there would be a photo or two of water ballooning in their archives. Unfortunately, no such photos exist. However, they decided to do a story on it. The night before the newspaper ran, the article posted to their Facebook page, and I was floored by the response. Hundreds of people shared it, hundreds of comments, friend requests, messages. The more I thought about the fact that we were the only place that I could find anyway that did this, the more curious I became about why Cordova? When did it start? Why did it end? Most importantly, could I get it started again? But first, it's important that you understand the people of Cordova and what it's like living there and growing up there. When you were growing up, what was it like there? Oh, Mayberry. 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 But Mayberry. It was just, just like TV. Everybody knew everybody. We could have had our own Sheriff Taylor who didn't have to carry a gun. You could leave your, your keys in your car all night long. Leave the house open. No, no locks on the doors. It's the type of place where, as an eight-year-old kid, I could walk down the street, down the hill to the grocery store, uh, take a $20 bill, and they would sell an eight-year-old a carton of cigarettes at Sun's Grocery, <laughs> and I would take it back to my grandmother with change in my pocket, and then I would take that change to Motor Inn Barbecue and buy, you know, a sandwich and some mozzarella sticks, but they, you know, it was, it, they all knew us. I knew I loved yeah. it when I was young. Now, most young people don't, oh, I didn't. Yeah. but I knew I loved it. I didn't want to leave. Man, the best place to live for me it is. I got so many good friends. I think it was amazing growing up here. Yes, yes. 
Cordoba can easily fit just about every Southern stereotype. We don't like to change. Uh, we don't like to go at a fast pace. Everything you think about the South there. There's also something that I've become very familiar with over the last four years serving in the capacity as mayor, how quickly we are to defend our own, even if they're wrong. It's, it's insane. And even if you're not like a Cordova boy anymore, you know, maybe yeah. you left, but we know you're one of us. Yeah. You know, if you're a Blue Devil, you're a Blue Devil through and through forever and ever. Man, that's a family. You're a Blue Devil. You know, you ain't nobody gonna mess with you in here. We got you back. We'd get in fights with each other and we'd have enemies. But let me tell you, if somebody came to town that wasn't from Cordova, your enemies became your friends and we all, we all took care of a business from intruders from the outside. I was arrested one time for some misdemeanor stuff. Tommy Hood was working and he had to be the one to come get me. Me and Tommy were close growing up. He gets me and we go down to the Butler building. <laughs> that was the jail, yeah. And he keys up on the radio. He says, 225 advise that subject. She'll always be a blue devil. <laughs> we actually lost our city attorney of 20 years because he kind of slipped up and was pursuing a Cordova boy, and uh, my counsel didn't take kindly to it and just <laughs> axed him. But that that's something that, that I absolutely love about who we are, the biggest fraternity. You know, once you're in it, you can't get out. Around the turn of the century, a company from Nashua, New Hampshire, founded what would become Indian Head Mills. The construction on the mill began in 1896, and can you imagine how much activity to get that mill built and worker, 100 worker houses built. It must have, have been a, a Herculean job and the ants were busy 24 hours a day. With the cotton mill came jobs. With jobs came new citizens to Cordova, and it grew. If memory serves, the 1900 census was about 576. And then 10 years later, uh, the population had swelled to 15, 1700, something like that. The mill at Cordova produced several different kinds of a world-class fabric uh, that was called Indian Head. At their height, they employed like 1,200 people or something like that. My mama worked there, my grandmother worked there, my uncles worked there. Half the people that lived in Cordova worked there at one time or another. My parents, my aunts and uncles all worked at the cotton mill. My grandfather started at the cotton mill when he was 12, I think, so 1911. He, he uh, ended up as the vice president of, uh, of the corporation really? of Indian Head Mills. The... Of the stories I hear about people who grew up in Cordova, I heard so many great things about the mill and how they would, they would have these parties in the city like during the summer. It was all the food you could eat and kids running everywhere. Downtown, it was lively back then. You had grocery stores, you had a mercantile, you had Tatum's Dry Goods Company. Yeah. You had a hardware store, you had a movie theater, and the ice house, and a couple of clothing stores. Pretty much everything that yeah. you needed right there. Yeah. Clearly the cotton mill was the economic cornerstone of Cordova, but it also played a huge role socially. My mother, who worked in the cotton mill, and bless her heart, it was unair conditioned, and she came home with lint in her hair, smelling like a field hand. But on Saturdays, she would primp and paint up and put on her Sunday best to go to town to buy groceries. And she was not gonna, gonna be seen by any of her friends looking bad. The whole town would be full of people. I mean, the streets would be packed. People wanted to be in town to socialize. By the 50s, Cordova was the industrial heart of Walker County. You had, this was the largest place. When I graduated from high school there, there was virtually a business in every storefront after the mill closed in 1962. One could see that uh, businesses were closing. My eighth grade class had 90 people in it. My graduating class had 60. So we lost a third family moving away to look for another job. By the time I was born in 1980, Cordova had already been on a steady decline. I never hated Cordova. I just never felt like I fit in. I couldn't wait to get out. It just never felt like home. Growing up in a small town in Alabama can have a myriad of challenges, especially if you're not really a hunter, you know, if you're not a football kid or a cheerleader. Or... It's really easy for communities to celebrate sports. Cordova is a football town. It's part of the community identity there. We were pretty impressed in that this small town of, what, 2,400 have over 3,000 on the home side. I remember people being in Piggly Wiggly parking lot with balloons. 
when the charter bus came through and they're cheering. I'm a Bama grad. Of course I love football. It's just, at my best, I was never better than an average athlete. I was a good musician. I was a good artist. I used to paint with oils growing up. I did a lot of creative things, and those things aren't really celebrated in a place like Cordova. It's not a place that's going to foster any creativity because you don't see it exhibited in other people. You know, you'd have been called names, you know, because you gotta, you got to play football. you got to play sports. There were many times growing up that I felt like an outsider. Halloween was not one of those times. Everyone was comrades in arms, not just for Halloween night, but for all the preparation that led up to Halloween night. Once we knew that we had to have ammunition, and I mean, we filled up balloons, had them in garbage bags, had them in buckets. If you don't have enough water, it's a pretty good impact. It's like getting shot with a softball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so you, there's a key to it. You gotta know yeah. just how much to put in that thing where to really get them, buddy. The Walmart in nearby Jasper, Alabama would sell out of water balloons days before Halloween. So if you waited too late, the only options were like the big party balloons or like the long skinny clown variety. And those will work in a pinch, but they're not ideal. Uh, it didn't matter how many you filled up, you always ran out quicker than you wanted to. My mom and dad let me miss school that day. Oh, yeah. You're filled, not the only one. We filled water balloons up all day long. You filled up balloons all day. You got them in garbage bags. We'd fill these garbage cans up, you know, and then you're like, it's weighing 700 pounds. And you're like, how am I going to get it in that truck? You know. You and I think I'm trying to grasp, like, the fact that there's a culture of this. Like, people have, like, a what they go to battle in. Yeah. Every year it kind of uh, evolved. Yeah. Eight, nine, and ten, all of us would load up in the backs of trucks. So we spent, what, about two weeks putting plywood up on the side. Grab I mean, it was, it was a full-on project plywood on their truck to protect their self and, and they would cut slots like a tank in the side of their trucks and wearing a football helmets and bicycle helmets and just, it was just crazy. It was like overnight, the whole town was fortified for water balloons. Small hometown bunkers or, or around street corners or cars or even the store owners would make sure that their water spigots outside were accessible so these kids could reload. And then the streets, you know, man, they, were, they was almost solid balloons. It always looked like some type of rainbow rained all over town the next day because all the multicolored balloons. I would watch the, the city workers sweep up those balloons. Just a million pieces of green and orange and yellow and yeah. white rubber everywhere, you know. Just on the outside spigot, there would be just this bow, and it would be there for a while. I mean, <laughs> you'd come back and it was just normal to see the rim of a, a, a balloon. All year long, those same spigots that you would see, there would still be pieces of balloon on that spigot. What's your first memory of it? I was really young. My brother had taken me. We had just a couple of sacks of water balloons. Yeah. There was some guys there that night. They were throwing squirrels. <laughs> what? Dead squirrels. They had killed a bunch of squirrels. Who, what, who was this? Do you know? I'm not going to say. Because <laughs> I think it escalated to a fight that night. Just people passing, passing through, you didn't hit them. Trucks with other people, ballooners in it. Oh, Lord, That's fair game. <laughs> you had the group that was in the parking lot, and then you had the ones that was in the vehicle. Of course, we had red lights back then, so you had to time it to where you didn't have to stop the red light. But our driver uh, made a point of coming to stops. That was where... I guess we met our Waterloo. Said, okay, Uncle Bobby, you're going to drive by real fast and we're going <laughs> to bomb them and get then us get us out of there so we can recuperate. Well, Uncle Bobby, he pulls up to the worst spot that you can be and just stops. <laughs> and I remember people jumping in, getting our water balloons out of our cooler, hitting us with our own water balloons. It's like, go, Walker Bobby, go, go, go. Well, we would kind of distract them on one side while somebody else was stealing their garter can on the other side, you know? There's no telling how many balloons you, your arm would be sore from throwing yeah. the next day, you know? And you know, actually the people that made balloons should have gave us some kind of money or something, because I know the stock went up when we bought all them balloons. A couple of people would say they threw eggs. I never witnessed that. Same thing I never had any complaints at the police department. We got a windshield busted. It was my junior year, I guess. So it was 94, 93, or 94. I think uh, one store window got cracked one time. And we and the kids, you know, I'm not so sure we broke it. I don't think I think it was already growing. <laughs> I don't remember anything uh, uh, bad happening. Of course, you know, we always have people with a black eye or 
or maybe a sprained ankle or I, I can't remember not one single major injury. I remember some people falling out of the back of trucks, but they didn't get, you know, it was a bump or a bruise, yeah. but nothing major that I, you know, in my whole time of throwing water balloons. Squeak busted my eardrum. I said that for years, and he'd say, I didn't know it, that was not me. I literally walked around school going, listen, put your hand up, I can blow air through my ear. <laughs> for the most part, it was just see who could get, who wet the fastest. Yeah. yeah. I only remember of two fights. My wife and I hadn't been married long, and I had always went to the, you know, down there and, and never got in a fight. Not once. And she said, you're going to get in a fight. I said, no, I'm not. Why would I go? I'm not going to get in a fight. I'm going through water blunts. People from the outside came in, and that was fine. You know, you could come in. It didn't matter if you was from Dora, Curry, you know, come in, have a good attitude. Let's have fun. But these people came in, you know, with that attitude, and they ended up getting it adjusted before they left. Yeah. He jumps out of the truck, and he's like in his 20s, and he's running his mouth at another kid that's about 14. And I said, look, this is good, clean fun, don't do that. We're not having that here. And Shannon was like the Incredible Hulk to me. I was like, there's Shannon. Oh, the guy was drunk, and he told him, man, go on, leave me alone, leave me alone. And he draws back like he's gonna do the karate chop, you know, ah, like that. And I said, man, don't do that. And he called me a few names, and I said, buddy, I don't, don't do that. Well, he took a swing at me, and, a, and I just hit him. It was just a one punt. I don't know if you call that a fight. Yeah. Well, it wasn't really a fight. It was one lick. But the thing about it was she knew before I got back home. <laughs> we didn't have cell phones in. So I'm trying to figure out. No, there. I'm trying to figure out how she found out so fast. The police were there, you know, so they were watching the kids pretty much. It wasn't like they were babysitting us, but they made sure nobody was crazy, nothing happened. You had the cops there. You had the firefighters there had everybody there, you know, and there's parents driving their kids around in the back of the truck. Even the adults were kids that night. Even the law. Was... Yeah. I can remember seeing them in office, like, full uniform, throwing balloons at kids. and We were just hitting the cars, and then the police car come up, and everybody's just standing there. And then you just see one water balloon fly out of the back and hit the cop car, Poosh! and everybody's like, oh, God. And then he gets on the speaker and said, my granny can throw harder than that. And of course, that's the wrong thing to tell a group of teenagers. Here comes one lobbing out, boom, hits his car, and then there's a hundred hitting him. I had a blue Volkswagen, and my doors wouldn't lock. So when you come across the railroad track, you turn right and go by Bo and Helen's. It's Jeff and Vaughn's now. And then you turn left and went back down the alley, and you come to a stop sign. And that's where our big police station was that had a jail, and you had to stop there. Well, the chief and his police officer was standing there with a hose pipe. If you was in the back of the truck, they're wetting you down. And you had to stop at the stop sign. If your door didn't lock, they opened the door and wet you in the wet really? your car. Oh, yes. So much fun. Do you I, know what kind of lawsuit that'd be today? <laughs> you think about that? After years, the fire department got involved. They would actually sit downtown and, and kind of help the police department out because the, their crowds would just get so big. It, occasionally, we would even we'd even turn on the uh, the loose gun or the, or the water gun on top of the truck and soak the crowds to a case. I remember that. But usually if the balloons didn't get them, the fire department was. Oh, yeah. That's what you run from all night long with the fire truck. Because <laughs> they're already, you know you're gonna get wet, you know, I mean, but you just wanna be at the end of the night and not at the beginning of the night. <laughs> the fire truck was terrible. I didn't realize how bad that hurt. And we had rain jackets on and they'd hit you with that thing, your rain jacket just fly open cause it was so hard pressure, you know? And you're trying to fight it and you, you don't wanna be the sissy and back out, but you're thinking, man, I wish they quit hitting me with that because they're killing me. <laughs> There's always going to be somebody that would come through town knowing it's going on. They're going to drive through town and get mad when their car gets hit with a water balloon. They'd slam on the brakes and just squall the tires backing up, you know, and they scream obscenities, you know, and that was just the grandest thing. <laughs> when you get out and you look and the whole town is doing it, and you're like, what do you do? You just get back in the car and keep driving, you know? So imagine the city where you live in a time when there were no cell phones. You're driving through town one night, and unexpectedly, someone throws something and hits your car with it. You drive to the police station to report it, and the first person that you talk to tells you this. I said, well, let me ask you something. He said, yes, ma'am. I said, you're from Cordova? And he said, yes, ma'am. I said, so you know this has been the thing for how many years? And how many ways can you go around to get through without going through town? So if you don't want to play, 
with a water balloon or so, then I suggest you go around. We're very tolerant. They knew that was just part of Halloween. If you wanted to trick or treat, you went outside the city because it, everybody here was having fun with water balloons. It seems like the community has been pretty interested in is, is starting it up again. Yeah. What would it take to make that a success? I think that the city officials being okay with it. Obviously, you want to have first responders and police there in case something does go wrong, which historically it hasn't. It really highlighted what a, a positive community thing it was and how I didn't expect people to miss it like that. Things like that make me wonder what else is right under my nose that I never paid attention to, you know? Do you have any idea how it started? I couldn't tell you how it started. My father introduced it to us. I guess every group of kids kind of has a mind that, that maybe we started it. You kind of grew up knowing it was just something that happened. I don't know. I guess it was just normal to me growing up, but I, you yeah, know. Did, did it ever occur to you that, that it didn't happen anywhere else around here? No, I don't think so. Somebody said it's been going on since the 50s. Yeah, 45 years that I can remember. The, I was five-year-old when I can remember them throwing water balloons yeah. in. Probably 65 I remember seeing them on the sidewalks the day after Halloween. Very late 50s or very early 60s. I can't really remember. But, I... but it's been going on now seven yes. years. Well, it's, I know it's been over 60. So I... Oh, it started way even when I was in school. When I came to Cordova in, in 47, they were already having the balloon battles. So 47, it was going on then. What was it like then? The same. I mean, it was mostly kids in the town. You know, you, you traveled in groups. There'd be, you know, five, six, seven, eight of us, maybe at the most. The town was broken up in four areas. According to those who were part of the early days of water balloons, groups from each neighborhood would assemble and travel to battle one another. So, according to Charles, this tradition began before 1947, the year World War II ended. After that conversation, I knew there was little hope in finding out how or exactly why it started. If I had to guess, I think the cotton mill somehow had to have played a role. Many of the people I interviewed talked about the community events organized by the mill. The Daily Mountain Eagle newspaper details a greased pole climbing contest in 1959. In light of that, water balloons don't sound so crazy after all. I had no concept of that it was like 60 or 70 years old. That's everybody's understanding of it. It's just like, uh, you know, I don't know when it started. It was going on when I was a kid. To me, it's really remarkable because you have a really small community and apparently, like, I've got friends who grew up less than 20 miles from here, never heard about it, yet it was almost as a part of your culture as, like, Santa Claus, seemingly, you know? <laughs> it's like, you don't remember the first time you hear about Santa Claus. I miss those times because we don't have those anymore. It helped kids together too. Yeah. You know? Well, it was fun. I mean, yeah. you know, it. We wasn't shooting one another with guns like they do today. We was throwing water balloons. <laughs> As I've gotten older and look back, it brought all the communities in Walker County together. And, you know, that's something we're missing nowadays. We don't we don't see that anymore. It kind of started going away. You know. As things, as we all got older or whatnot, you know, it didn't really completely die out in, in town, but it slowed down a lot. And then, of course, in 2011. To my knowledge, there ain't been another balloon battle since. What brought about the end of water balloons is a more difficult story. A story that would land Cordova in the global spotlight and for all the wrong reasons. We've had a report of winds in excess of 100 miles per hour in Cordova. As a child, I remember being told, like an old Indian proverb was, Cordova would never be directly hit by a tornado. If one ever did hit Cordova, it would, it would destroy it. We, we knew going in it was going to be a bad day. The night before, we didn't expect the morning to be that active. All the parameters were in place for violent weather. We didn't know the day before we'd have 62 tornadoes in one day. We didn't know the day before we had 252 people that would die. It sounded like somebody was standing outside the house shooting it with, like, buckshot. I mean, like it was just, really? you know, spraying the house. And Come on, Mike, it's here. So he comes in there to the closet, 
And I'm already in there, me and, me and Lexi down like this. He came in and he tried to pull the closet to and he couldn't. Three times. Three times he pulled it. And the minute I cut the TV on, he says, if you're in Cordova, you need to be in a safe place immediately. Where we're grabbing the kids to run downstairs and all I remember is the metal of the metal roof just popping the sound that it made. Before we even got downstairs, it was over. And I knew what it was. I said, man, we was just in a tornado. Before that day, I was skeptical, you know, tornado warning for Walker County. And you'd look at the weather and, you know, be like, eh, you know, it's not, it's not going to do nothing. And we didn't expect the morning round to be as bad as it was. That in itself was a tragedy. The morning event killed five people, left a quarter of a million people with no power. I mean, we had debris everywhere. We had to check houses, make sure people were all right. You know, just your standard safety stuff for us, just to make sure the community was okay and I'd get roadways open back up. Our station was damaged that morning, so we had to set up a temporary downtown by the police station. The sun was shining. I mean, it was beautiful outside. My mom called and she said, y'all need to go home. We need to make a plan. I, we had no idea there was another storm coming. I mean, all of us in the newsroom joking around, we're thinking it could never hit the same place twice, you know. Uh, toward four or five o'clock, that's when it was just like bullets from Hades. Getting close to five o'clock, when James Spann said, anybody in Parrish, Alabama, take cover. Cordova, get ready. And by the time he said that, it was like the power went out. But this thing is sitting almost right over Parrish right now. And next is Cordova, where there's no power. The damage was extensive. Downtown Cordova was extremely heavily damaged this morning uh, in a pre-dawn round of storms. And this is going to go right over that community. The statistical odds of a community that small being hit by two violent tornadoes in one day uh, I, I can't imagine that. I'd say it's probably one in a million. Uh, we're about a mile from Cordova exit 72. We're, it's on the Cordova Gorgas Road. This this thing is actually coming at us. You can see the debris way up in the air. Was that a thought that it's, it's going through downtown? Or? No, it, it wasn't a doubt. All of a sudden you just see clouds start moving in and then they stopped. We watched the tornado come up by the water tower. Go, go. Get down with the kids. Holy shit. Get in the back, sit down. Now. Now. Just blew another transformer. Oh, here it goes. Come on, son. Go. All the way in the back. Y'all get in there. Oh, my God. We had a basement we could get in underneath City Hall, but it had been hit that morning. We didn't know if it was going to hold up or not. That's all we had. I can remember hearing my dad say, it is tearing Cordova up. And then I could see all the debris through those windows. And that was weird. You just see, you could see everything just flying everywhere. And the place where Cindy rode out the storm would become much more significant days later. And then I started hearing things upstairs, like moving around. The ceiling starts to buckle. I thought, this really may be it for me. No, I was standing out there until it got probably 300 yards away, and I told him, I said, so this is going to be bad. You better start praying now, because it's going to hit us. And it wasn't a second. It was here. And, you know, people say it sounds like a train, and it sounded more like a souped-up jet, like the shuttle taking off when you're in the middle of it, because we were as much in the middle of it as you could be. The afternoon tornado, this was a, a large EF4 tornado. These are rare, uh, only about one in 80 tornadoes are that strong. The wind velocity can exceed 180 miles an hour. And uh, very few people on the planet have experienced that. And many that do experience that don't survive. We had four people that lost their lives that day. Of the four deaths was 24-year-old Jackson Van Horn. Jackson was sitting by a brick pillar and I was sitting beside him and it, it was just blowing like dirt and insulation and, and garbage and stuff all up in our faces. Everything, everything just fell. I felt myself dying. I felt like there's no, there's no way out. In a matter of minutes, the storm is over. Mikey was like, babe, are you okay? And I said, yeah, but, but Jackson didn't make it. He never cried out. And I don't know if you call it a vision 
I saw his mom take him and hug him. Jackson's mother, Tony Van Horn, passed away in 2006 after a battle with cancer. And I knew then Jackson was okay. I still have a hard time. We, we do, we do. 10-year-old Justin Doss, 12-year-old Jeremy Doss, and 45-year-old Annette Singleton died while seeking refuge from the storm in Miss Singleton's home on Green Avenue. Miss Singleton's 15-year-old son, Madison Phillips, would be the only one to survive. Stuff started caving in, roof tore off, and I saw my mom. Very slow, slight moment, I saw the boys. Next thing I know, I feel myself get snatched. So I got snatched up in the air. It felt like my arms, my legs, my head was trying to tear loose from each other. I don't remember landing. I don't remember getting up. I remember walking from my path of a church. I woke up inside the surgery and they ended up putting me back to sleep. My brother ended up calling me on the phone. He told me over the phone that the boys and my mother had passed away. I feel sorry for my mom. I feel sorry for the boys. Joshua and Jonathan were definitely loved and, and accepted and made friends very quickly. Uh, losing them was really a difficult thing for the entire community. Now the controversy begins with Miss Singleton's son, Madison, still hospitalized due to injuries he sustained from the second tornado. Madison claims that after the first tornado, he and his mother, along with the Doss brothers, tried to seek shelter at Long Memorial Church and were turned away. We didn't feel safe at the house. We went to the church. It was right across the street from my house. And my mom asked the lady, could we come inside the church for shelter? And the lady said, we're not letting nobody into the church. I said, mom, nobody can go into the church, but look, they're letting people go into the church right now. And it's all white people. And my mom told me, she said, don't worry, baby, it'll be all right. God got us. So we left, we went back to the house. They took shelter in Miss Singleton's home next to the laundromat, just as they had during the first tornado that morning. The house would be directly in the path of the EF4 tornado that would devastate what was left of downtown Cordova. The four of them would be found hundreds of feet from where they took shelter, and Madison would be the only survivor. Media outlets everywhere pick up the story. It even shows up in the New York Times. The news of the devastation takes a backseat to the stories of racism in Cordova, Alabama. Actually, I find out about the day or so after the storm that they're planning a march on Cordova. So here we are dealing with the devastation and now the possibility of, uh, you know, a, a racial march in, in Cordova. Rumors begin to circulate. Tracy Utley, along with her sister Terry, find themselves accused of turning away the family. Now Tracy's recollection of what happened that day is much different than Madison's. It begins shortly after the first tornado passed through that morning. One of the buildings there uh, along Main Street, one of our parishioners, uh, Tracy Utley, had a consignment shop in there. The middle of town was already you know, blocked. They wouldn't let anybody in. I crawled under the rubble of where the doors were and got to the corner to get the, the money bag. While I was in there, I had, you know, you look up and, and I'm seeing all this new merchandise that we just put in the store. People had backed their trucks up and people just started helping. I just said, let's just move it up into the basement of the church. We got the store emptied. It probably took a couple of hours. When just Ryan and I were standing out front, he asked me, hey, what are we going to do about leaving the church unlocked with all of your store stuff in here? And, you know, we told him, if somebody feels the need to take something that's here, then, then they need it. They were trying to get it sorted around, and, and my wife, Jamie, and I went back to the house. And By the time we finished, it was probably... Three o'clock, I was standing there when the lady pulled up, and my sister told her, anybody's welcome to come in this church. Technically, it's not a shelter, but the doors will be open. That's, that's exactly what was said. The doors will be open. Most Cordova residents doubt the validity of Madison's story. Well, it never happened. Those kind of rumors should, you know, should be quelled immediately, not put on the news and all that kind of stuff. But, and I, I can't believe the people that, that I was involved. I don't think that they would turn somebody away. I mean, that, that's hard. And I'm not saying that's not possible. I want to say that that was just a rumor that got started, but I, I don't know anything about that situation. I know the lady that they were talking about. 
And I know that's the furthest thing from the truth. Some were critical of the Daily Mountain Eagle for not covering the story. There were a lot of racial type things that were coming out. We couldn't find any truth in those stories. We couldn't find substantial truth that would let us know, yes, that happened, so we would put it in the paper. You know, um, other media outlets ran with it that were not local. You know, they were just, they were looking for a story and they were looking to sensationalize the story is what I think happened. For somebody who doesn't know about that process, like what's the rule of thumb? And we really would definitely have to have some type of credible source, a police officer, or a firefighter, a rescue worker, people who, who had no political gain in anything that, you know, were just doing their jobs that would, would tell us if something happened. Nothing came forward of anything other than, you know, the people who passed away in the storms, the destruction that was left behind, and the recovery efforts that took place after that. I mean, that's, that's the story. The only one that knows for sure was, her, was the poor lady that's gone. Now, in the interview with Madison, he mentions a couple of his teachers, Mr. and Miss Howell, and they actually sat with him in the hospital after he lost his mother. Even when they had to go to work and teach, they was there. They took turns. Then one would leave, one would come. And they didn't have to do it. So they have my highest respect. They always was there for me. When I interviewed the Howells, they told me about running into Madison and his mom the morning after the first storm had passed through. They were actually in front of the laundromat, walking down the, between the railroad tracks and the laundromat at that time. And uh, it was him and his mom and the two little boys. And I asked them if they had anywhere to go that evening. And they were going to go over to his sister's house over in Pratt City. I remember Madison and the mom even that morning telling me, you know, she said she'd come get us as long as we had the gas money, you know. So, And I asked them, did they have money? And they said yes, you know. So, And they were very confident not wanting to come with us. You know what I'm saying? And it wasn't because of trust, because I think we'd already built that relationship with the mom. The Howells were close to Madison. In fact, they even offered to take him in after he lost his mother. So if anyone knows Madison well, it's the Howells. And I was curious as to what they thought happened that day. Did they think this really happened? You know, what you never know, truly know somebody, but I just don't think the people who were talking about that were involved in that would, that that would ever happen. You know, yeah. I don't think he remembered much at all. It, he, I'm not sure that he was conscious when they first found him. I don't but, think he was. I don't know if I was passed out for a certain amount of time. On the ground, I don't remember getting up. It, I was kind of beat up, really beat up from a tornado. I, mean, I forget how many stitches it was, but it was a you know gash all the way around, you know. And, and I don't think he remembers. You know what I'm saying? Right. I don't think That's he remembers much of it because he doesn't remember me coming down and seeing them, you know. And he even told me too, you know, he said, "Coach, it could have been from that morning actually when That's it what was I them, remember. them two in the bathtub, and then so my mom and then me." That. He couldn't tell you for sure if that's what he remembered or if he was just thinking back to that morning. Many of those who argue that this didn't happen that day call into question Madison's memory of the event. I think I think it may have been a misunderstanding because I was kind of aggravated at first too. You know, when I heard the story at first, because it was it was frustrating. I mean, she can probably tell you how mad I was that, that I thought that somebody had turned away somebody just especially because of who they were, what they would look like, and. But we had a relationship with him and, yeah, and his and family, really and so it made was, it really emotional. You know, but I worked with Miss King, Donna King, who was. One of the special aid teachers at Bankhead, and she is very involved with that church and always has been. It really tears her down that, that people would think that about somebody in their church, you know. And when people would say things and say, well, your church, and I would say, but you know what? My church is made up of people. That's right. And I'm part of that. I go through the pews and think about the people that sat on those pews, and I cannot think of one of them that would do that. From what she says, and she said this is, you know, just talking with people in the church was that that it was a misunderstanding. They just told them that that was not a place to be safe during a tornado. You know, everyone agrees that Miss Singleton was told this is not a shelter. Ryan Rosser, the pastor there, explained that this is an issue of liability. Shelters must meet structural requirements, and since the building was a century old, it definitely didn't meet those standards. And it certainly wasn't a racial thing. Why do you say that? Because the congregation is interracial. From what I hear now, I think Ms. King told me there was actually some black people in the basement of the church. Cindy Lang was in town earlier that morning after the first storm came through. She was actually in the basement of the church during the second storm. Don't know what percentage was black and what was white, but it, it definitely was a mix of people. And there was nothing nothing going on that would indicate anybody wasn't welcome. I mean, we were going out there saying, y'all need to get in here. 
Now, as you can imagine, this situation is still a sensitive issue in Cordova. Now, there have been several other people who confirmed that more than one person of color was in the basement of the church that day. But Cindy was the only person willing to talk to me on camera. In fact, in June of 2011, a publication of the United Methodist Church had this to say. One AT&T worker who asked not to be identified credits the open church with saving his life. We were working in the streets when a man came and told us that we needed to take shelter in the church. They were gathering up every living person they could find and taking them to the church. I know for a fact that there were some black people in the church because they were working with us. As far as the church turning somebody away, I don't believe it for a minute. The first time that I came to church here, we were just invited to come to church here and came, probably late 80s. And there was a young man here, a young black man. His name was Andre. And I was just real impressed that even, you know, during that time that there was a, a black man that, that worshipped here. And he was friends with the people here. And my experience with worship and with church had always been that it was very segregated. And so that was really intriguing to me that during that time, it just I thought, this is a place that is welcoming that loves people and that these people are, are friends with each other and they care about each other. So if those stories are true, what happened that day? Did this church really turn them away? They said I lied on newspapers and they tried to cover up the whole simple fact that it happened. After the first version of this segment was finished, I sent it to the Howells. They actually sent a response statement and asked if I would include it. Our main concern is for Madison to know that we never doubted him. We never felt like Madison would have intentionally created or falsely reported how those events unfolded. We truly believe that it was a misunderstanding and that no one side had intentions of misleading others to depict the other side falsely. We feel it's also important to understand the magnitude of Madison's trauma and head injury. He was being asked to recount the events of that day while he had not even recovered or even truly understood what all had happened to him. I never have thought that this young man went out and made up a story and told a lie and, and then it got to be bigger and bigger and bigger. I never ever thought that. I thought that maybe she had come to the the front door and there was nobody there or maybe she came to the front and it was locked or or something. I just felt like that that there was just a misunderstanding somehow. Maybe because she was black and she figured that they won't let me in. Right. You know, some people stay like that. Oh, I can't go to that church because it's white church. Where you go to church? Where you go? I go there. Well, they don't want nobody over there. I said, I can go all the time. See, they didn't grow up with that. You can't go here because you're black. They won't want, they don't want you there. They don't want to let you in. And I tell them, I go here all the time. But What do you think? Do you think that happened that way that day? Well, segregation is still here in Cordova now. Everybody's not on the same level. There's some people still have that in them. Not only white, black scattered too. What do you think it takes to get past that stuff? Some of us you will never get past. I'm hoping that it will change as we as we raise children to be more open and more loving will. and to you know, I hope. That old generation? No. The young generation? Yes. The young was like the, us. The, the young was like us. <laughs> right. They play together. They go out together. They enjoy each other. They don't see no color. Some of us, you will never get past. Really. From a storytelling perspective, my hope was to tell the truth of what happened that day. Unfortunately, our most credible witness suffered severe head trauma. I don't have to be a neurologist to know that an injury like that can affect your memory. But I think there's a bigger issue present. So let's assume Madison doesn't remember all the details of that day. I think we can all agree that he remembers his mother. And he lost her that day. And he lost her that day at least in part because she didn't feel welcome at Long Memorial. And I don't think it had anything to do with the people at Long Memorial. I think it had more to do with past experiences that she had lived through and maybe her dealings with racism and being treated differently. I think that is the true issue here, that we still have a lot of work to do. That all kind of faded in relationship to the story about the FEMA trailers. With these issues of race still present, 
all these headlines start showing up about how Cordova's mayor, Jack Scott, won't allow FEMA to bring in trailers for homeless people. Cordova Mayor Jack Scott is invoking a city ordinance that bars any single wide trailer, and that is precisely the type of trailer being offered by the federal government to folks whose homes have been destroyed. And as we showed you back on Friday, a lot of folks in Cordova are uh, none too thrilled. The town was ready to lynch the mayor. Felicia Boston would be quoted in several publications in the aftermath of the storms. A friend of ours named Danny Banks, his trailer was literally in Disney Lake. The man was lucky to be alive. It's like he fell through the cracks. That's how it felt. Because this poor man is living in a tent. He had no other options. My dad's brother was in England when this happened. And he found out about all of it because he saw his brother on TV in England. Footage from town hall meetings where townspeople are screaming at at the mayor. And he gets upset and kind of yells some things back. So it just turns into this huge circus. A news outlet in Taiwan does a parody of, of him. It caused people to be a little irrational because they were thinking they were standing up for those that were in pain and suffering, but they didn't get their facts straight before their emotions. Everybody's emotions were raw. The whole deal got blew way out of proportion. Was, and we're all sitting around here going, what are they doing? They take a disaster and try to turn it into some kind of evil. He became betrayed as a different man than he really was. Yeah. Now, all of this is surrounding a city ordinance from 2008. Whatever board we got down here had ruled against trailers in this town. Uh -huh. That was out of Jack's hands. They put it all on Jack. That wasn't just Jack's idea. That was the ordinance we had in the city. The city ordinance at the time does not allow mobile homes in certain areas. And a lot of the areas that were hit were areas that you couldn't just prop up a single white trailer. It's not that the family didn't qualify for the help. Your property had to make so many stipulations to be able to get it placed on your property. What everybody truly wanted was a temporary FEMA trailer, which from what we all learned with Katrina was a camper. FEMA was just getting out of the camper business. They were now doing 70 foot long mobile okay. homes. You can't put a 70 foot long trailer in a 50 foot long lot. Plus they want to give it to you temporary so you can rebuild. You can't rebuild if it's in your way. Most of these people didn't qualify. They couldn't meet the standards to get a trailer. If you had a damaged house there, there wasn't room to put a trailer there to start with. Now, if it had been campers, then yeah. They could have fit on the lots. People could have rebuilt their houses. You know, we had lists that they would bring to us with that long-term recovery. Yeah. If they couldn't help them, we found avenues to get them the help they needed. And his aunt lived just a few houses up. She destroyed. lived in a mobile home and it destroyed their place, you know. That morning. That was kind of one of the first places they were talking about putting a FEMA trailers over there. Right. The guy who lived next to her, and I think he's the one that really started raising a big fuss. Because I'm telling you, you know, my aunt did own that home she lived in, and they gave her, they paid her a lot of money for that home. It pretty much helped put a big down payment on their new home. And these people that may not have gotten that temporary, they still got FEMA funding. They still got assistance from FEMA, but you don't hear those stories either. FEMA, you know, they came even to where we live. And we, you know, they were walking the streets, checking on people up there. Mm -hmm. And they, we were trying to tell them that, you know, we didn't have any damage. He said, well, did you buy anything for after the tornado? I said, yeah, I bought another Gen generator to help out down in Cordova and ch another chainsaw, chainsaw and stuff like that. And he said, well, let's at least turn that in. A lot of people also thought that, you know, I got that free home when it's mine. But after 12 months, they come back to collect those. And a lot of people didn't think that because of the years people stayed in them in, in Louisiana. Yeah. But it's because they couldn't get people to move to move yeah. out. If you let a lot of those FEMA trailers get in, they're so hard to ever get out. Looking back at it, it's a good thing. Some people would not have moved out of those trailers. Now the rationale behind this ordinance was that a mobile home community next door would discourage would-be builders from relocating to Cordova. Now, there's a lot of research out there about how mobile homes affect the value of the properties adjacent to them. And there doesn't seem to be a clear-cut answer, especially since property values are so subjective. It's not that those people are, that we're better than those people. We were trying to keep the property value and, and look to the future where somebody might want to come and build something here in Cordova. We didn't want to become a trailer city, and our ordinance, you know, was drawn up where we outlined different locations where a trailer could go, but it had to be a certain trailer, you know. The people that were against us are not bad people. The people that criticized us are bad. You know, everybody's got a right to believe what they want to. 
we did what we thought was best for Cordova. Yeah. And, you know, and everybody's got their own opinion. That's the last national news story about Cordova. But they'll never know the true good that he did while he was in office. Our current mayor gets the attaboy for a lot of the improvements that's made in town, but a lot of those things were set in motion by the administration before them. The grocery store. Mayor Scott had driven that ship. Uh, he cut the ribbon on that thing. Even though it was built during my administration, he's the reason there was money here for it. A lot of those roots and seeds were planted from the guy that everybody learned to hate. <laughs> he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. There'll never be a harder working mayor ever in Cordova. Yeah, I don't know if anybody that loves Cordova any more than Jack Scott. Uh, whether it was at the park, whether it was downtown or wherever, Jack was always doing something, and he worked all the time for Cordova. If they needed somebody to drive the garbage truck, that's what the mayor did that day. If they had a water main or sewer main break, he was down in the ditch with the guys. But, they, you know, nobody looks at the good stuff anymore. They always want to see the bad. He just wasn't that great of a communicator. Yeah. And look, it wasn't what he said. It was how he said it. Jack wasn't the greatest people person in the world. And I think even him, he might agree. Well, of course, my big mouth got me into a lot of trouble. If I had to do over again, you know, I might try to be a little bit more tactful or something and maybe try to explain better, but uh, I don't regret our stance we took. Our rules were good. Our rules were well intended. Jack's only flaw was the inability to convey the facts. They took that and ran full speed ahead. I put myself in his shoes. Uh, let's just say I'm the mayor and the story is blown up that we're not allowing FEMA trailers and we've got homeless people living everywhere in tents. I'm gonna walk in here and tell you the truth. Out of all the people, there were two people who qualified. And every one of them had somewhere to live. None of them were homeless. None of them were forced out. None of them needed an actual FEMA trailer. I would have told you that. Yeah. He didn't tell anybody that. Would love to talk to you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor Scott, we've been calling you a number of times the past couple of days. And probably Jack's attitude didn't help, and their attitude didn't help either. I think there was trouble on both sides of it. In the heat of the moment and situations like that, people can misinterpret what you're really trying to do, and I, I believe Jack was looking at the future. In the age of social media, public opinion is a huge tool that can serve as a balance of power for those who are underrepresented. However, innocent people can easily get caught up in the crossfire. It got the best of, of Terry and I both. Um, I think he'll tell you to this day that it, it was a difficult time. But people talk pretty rough to us sometimes. And, you know, we had some threats, but that's part of it, too. And when, you, when you see somebody who did so much... Yeah threatened. Yeah. At that point, I, I realized that we can't go anywhere. This is going to follow us from now on. This, this has overshadowed every great thing, an Eagle Scout, upstanding citizen, husband, father, church member. Where has all of this gone? Because this is what he's going to be remembered for. And it, it's a shame to see folks twist that when the man, he did so much yeah. for a community. I mean, Believe it or not, I had a couple of people apologize to me for what they wrote in the paper and said on the radio. Really? And honestly, I just go up to old Jack and put my arm around him, hug his neck to him and say, Jack, I love you. <laughs> and the time he said, I believe you're the only one. Terry and I have heard all of our lives, you're a Scott and you're tough. And we don't let people like that affect us or who we are. And if I just told my dad, I said, no, Daddy, you do. Yeah. It's hard. You get tired. To top off what would be an already disastrous 2011, in 2012, 25-year-old council member Drew Gilbert would run against Mayor Scott and win the election for mayor. For me, it was something I always thought about doing. Really? Um, I, I don't know. I always felt compelled to lead. I felt like it was something I could do. and. And then you got elected class president, student government president, beta club president, those types of things when I was in school. Um, but I was talking about it even when I was in high school. Like the guy started campaigning to be mayor like when he was 13. As he went to school, he would tell everyone on campus, people around campus knew, you know, that guy, that guy's here to be mayor. Well, I did it younger than I think I was ever anticipating. Watching Cordova kind of decline for years and years and years, my entire life. 
population was going down, businesses were closing, and then the tornadoes hit, and it was kind of like, this might be one of those now or never scenarios. Like, you know, you talk to guys that, that are in the ministry that are called to preach or, or, you know, people that feel a higher calling to do something. I very much felt that way about that time, that place, running for mayor. It felt like it was what I was supposed to do with my life. And, you know, it's a small impact on a small slice of the world, but what if we had more of that? He's done a good job, and the, and the old council's done a good job. I disagree with some things they did, but that gum, you know, everybody, there a lot of people disagree with what I did. Yeah. And you, can't, you can't please everybody, but they've done a good job. So not only was the visual landscape of downtown Cordova changed after the storms, for a couple years after, it wasn't safe to be in those areas downtown where water balloons were thrown. When it all got blew away, I think that was, it took the steam out of it. Everything pretty much stopped downtown completely until we tore down the buildings and, and tried to do a little rebuilding, you know, rebuilding some of our city infrastructure. The calamity has passed and the cleanup has started, but now, like for Cordova, there's not a whole lot left. As soon as the, after it hit, county cop come walking down through, asking is everybody all right, you know, and uh, courtesy, to, uh, what about downtown? That county cop said, there ain't no more town. We knew that for that small Walker County community, this was gonna be a do-over. You pretty much had to start over. I've done a lot in my career but that's probably the most trying days I've ever had in my life. Many of us that didn't sleep for three days straight. I didn't go home for well over a week, and I practically lived down here for three months straight, just going home, getting a shower, and coming back. Our grandparents, they're like, you know, make sure you have water, make sure you have money tucked under your mattress. Like, you really need those things during a situation like that, and it, it made me realize, man, we are not prepared if, this, if stuff like this happens. Last word was I had 19 fatalities in my district, a loss of 1,200 residences. People struggling, you know, to get even water. So we didn't have power for days. If I remember right, it was probably about seven days. There was no groceries. We had to go all the way to Winfield, 30, 45 minutes to Winfield. Money was an issue, too, to get money out of your banks. Every road was blocked. We weren't even able to get back into town that night. The National Guard surrounding the city with M16s. It was just incredible to see the, the destruction. Like, I, I would have never... I could have never pictured it without seeing it in person. Riding through was horrendous. Like, I cried for hours. It was devastating. But then you see everybody working. You know, I mean, everybody working together in its community. Most people will help if asked, but that's not how the people of Cordova work. It, it was all business. Uh, that operation they had running up there. And again, these were the townspeople. When we saw them, they were exhausted. And I could see that in their eyes, but they didn't stop them. I think it was uh, partly some public service officials, firemen. I ended up uh, taking a role for the city as a disaster coordinator. He was the best thing during the tornadoes, Dean was. That's, he yeah, he worked his butt off. There's few people really understand how much Dean Harbison did as a young man. There was a lot put on a young man's shoulders, and I felt like that he shouldered it very well. There's a good writer, a guy named Rick Braggs. One of the things he wrote about was how uh, a guy with a chainsaw is worth a hundred with a clipboard, and how Alabamians understand that, and they, they rushed right in, and all of a sudden we weren't Democrats or Republicans, we weren't liberals or conservatives, we weren't black, we weren't white, we, we didn't live in the city, we didn't live in the country, we were just one for that brief time. Went to my dad's house, got chainsaws, and went straight to town. I told my boss, I probably won't be back tonight. There's a lot of people that needs help. You didn't really know where to start. We just started cutting on roads. I think a lot of people that were maybe self-centered, and I fight that, I think we all do to some degree, they become centered on helping other people in need. And that's why we're here. And once you figure that out, life gets pretty good. We had people working side by side with chainsaws that didn't like each other. A lot of churches were involved, and that's what the church is all about. Watching your tongue and looking after widows and orphans. And, and to me, widows and orphans means people that are in severe need. And it wasn't a church in Cordova, it wasn't involved. You didn't just cook for your bunch. You cooked for a lot of people. We cooked probably 12 hours a day. The Piggly Wiggly was donating everything that they had for people 
Everything that was left, they were like saying, here, get it and cook it. Pushing buggies every day. They had breakfast stuff, they had lunch stuff, they had supper stuff. You had a group that would come through in the morning, pass out batteries for your flashlight, bring bottled water, make sure you had food. Then later on, another group would come through and make sure you had toiletries. I rode in the back of a truck for all day long and we were handing out sandwiches. And when I tried to give the National Guard, he was standing up by a long memorial. He was standing there and he had his gun. I was like, you want a sandwich? <laughs> And at any given time, there'd be 50 or 60 people out here from places I didn't know. And you know, these folks came out of, it was just amazing. I mean, they didn't ask, they just come and did it. And it was done before you even knew it. And it was done by people that you didn't even know. When we came through there, we really didn't see anybody that was hungry because they all been fed. And it was by their own neighbors. And these were a lot, in a lot of cases, probably neighbors they didn't know that maybe lived on the other side of town. People work for each other for months. We decided to talk to the city officials to try to get permission. So everyone's finally on the same page for water balloons to happen again this year. Which is one of the things I hope for with the film is to do it again this, this Halloween. Being with the fire department, what are your thoughts on that as far as like a regulation perspective? Well, if we could, try to get something like that started again, we'd definitely try to be involved for the safety aspect, if nothing else, awesome. to help block off streets or whatnot. You um, know, as long as the city would be for it, yeah. we, we would support it. If we're not there, then, you know, things tend to get a little out of hand or whatnot. And if somebody yeah. ever gets hurt, we're there to help them. Yeah. We actually started the trunk retreat with that in mind. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's bring people back downtown and, and try to have something fun like that. Now, of course, we're not letting them fling anything at each other yet, but um, yeah. That, yeah. The next would be the police chief, Nick Smith. What are your thoughts on actually throwing balloons at each other this Halloween? Yeah, yeah I love it. I, you know, I, I like anything that gets the community involved. You know, just, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a little fun, you know. Yeah. As long as, yeah. you know, you're doing it in a safe manner and it's all in, in, in fun, then, I mean, I'm all for it. The only person left was the mayor, Drew Gilbert. And I, I felt pretty good about Drew being on board with water balloons again. Oh, absolutely. I would love it. I've talked to Nick about that too, mm -hmm. Dean, because I, you know, I yeah, explained yeah, both yeah. of them, like, <laughs> if this goes south, you I want, you're going to have to clean up the mess. You, you want the blessing of the public safety. Yeah. So, yeah, I get that. Man, we'd be all in. Okay. I, I, I'd love it. Since 2011, Cordova has been rebuilding. A lot of people moved down after the tornadoes because they lost their homes. Have you ever considered leaving? No. Why is that? I don't know. It's just something special, being a part of this school and being a part of this, this community. Do away with it, move away. There was, no, there was never a question of that. It was, you know, we can't leave these people and, and we gotta help these people. That's what community is. It's not just a place to live. It's maybe like New Orleans and Katrina, maybe a lot of those people just didn't have that connection. And it was just better for them just to leave because it was just a place. It was just there, you know, a place to live. You don't have the tight knit community, you know, as you do here. The community roots are so deep, it's, you know, most of the people that, even people that lost their house in the tornado had, no, it wasn't even a thought of leaving. The grass is greener on the other side. I don't think that's the mentality here. I live beside my parents. I still live right beside where I grew up and I've never, ever thought about going anywhere else. It's family to me. I mean, everybody's family in Cordova, so. I was born, raised here. I had a chance that I could have left and I didn't, you know, because it, it's all, it, it's home and it'll always be home. And A lot of people describe community as this place and to me community is the people around us not the soil we stand on and there's a big part of that mentality that people have in Cordova that I don't really understand it always just seems to be something instinctive that you can't explain did you ever consider moving back no to Cordova? no uh, I was I was part of that co coterie that wanted to get out of Dodge and I and I knew there was a larger life out there and I, and I wanted to, to see what it was all about. And some people are not curious. I mean, we wouldn't have had anything to do to support a family. So unfortunately, I mean, even ja you know, Jasper wasn't 
a consideration. When we, I went to college, like I missed it. I missed the closeness. I think maybe in college I came back for some games, but even then I felt a little out of place. But it's because it's I don't have the, the history that so many other families do. Yeah. Like my parents aren't at the game and my grandparents aren't at the game and I don't have a cousin on the field. And If you look at the research, when people leave a small town and get an education, they rarely come back. I remember multiple conversations when people found out I was moving an hour away to Tuscaloosa to go to college. They were really concerned that I would lose my accent and or my faith. I grew up a preacher's kid, so that was instilled in me at a very, very young age. And I think that has huge implications for how we see community. Christianity plays a huge part in the community values of the small town, and especially in small towns in the South. I hear a lot of disparaging comments about the ignorant religious right from all these damned small communities. I began to ask these people where they're from. Everyone's answer was from some small town somewhere, right? You all came from also humble beginnings and you all had families that worked their ass off their whole life to try to give you a better way. So if you assholes leave these small towns and you get educated, as you say, perhaps they live in their bubble, but yet you live in your bubbles of New Orleans, in Portland, around all these like-minded people because you also feel safe there. So you're no different. Instead of engaging them in conversation, you call them names, you call them misogynistic, you call them bigots, you call them racist, you call them stupid, you call them ignorant. And then they say, well, it's not our responsibility to, to have to deal with their ignorance. And I said, what is your responsibility with your education? Your number one responsibility with an education is to share it. If you don't share it, otherwise, what good is it? And I said, these people that you say are ignorant, some of the best people I've ever met in the world, and it hurts me. I'm thankful for where I came from, and I'll never call them ignorant. That is my roots. I learned they, they're, they're full of wisdom. They gave you this opportunity. That was the launching pad. But instead of sharing that education, you call them ignorant. It's disgusting. Examples of those Southern stereotypes exist in Cordova, but that doesn't mean the whole community should be labeled as such. And I think sometimes that's what happens. Well, I, I'd have to say that the gossip is the primary product of the community. So we had a, a domestic situation at the home I grew up in just uh, after I graduated. It was a very traumatic situation for our family. I didn't really sleep that night. The next morning I get up to go to town to get lunch at Motor and Barbecue and two different people that heard about it on their police scanner the night before and just walk up to me and ask me what happened in a restaurant full of people. And they didn't seem to understand at all why I didn't want to talk about it. Those are the things growing up that I could not wait to get away from. You never had privacy. Everybody was in your business and they only remember all the negative things that happen. It's like family. You know, family will drive you insane. and <laughs> You'll be ready to choke slam somebody. But when, the, you know, at the end of it, that's family. You know, you're gonna be there. I don't think there's many places in this world as close knit as this place is. Yeah. For people who lived in Cordova when I was growing up, this place was worth the inconvenience of having to travel to work, uh, to get groceries, to go to the doctor. There was nothing really close. It took an hour to get to Birmingham. It took 20 minutes to get to, to Jasper, the closest city where there was a Walmart. All the things that make life convenient for us now, they pretty much thumb their nose at because they're gonna stay where they are. In 2016, I-22, or quarter X as we called it, would open with two exits in Cordova. This cut the commute to Birmingham in half. The majority of the people that live here, they don't work here. They drove 60 miles to Birmingham every day. So 60 miles each way. Looking at this has given me perspective of my own town. And it's made me appreciate, you know, small town Alabama a lot more. You can have all the amenities and all of the stores and all the whatever. But if the people around you aren't there when you need them, is that really community? There's things that's worth working for. People really enjoy life here. I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for just the people in the community. I never noticed all those community bonds as a good thing growing up right. because, you know, you get a motor and barbecue the day after the police are at your house and 
just anybody ask you, hey, what happened yesterday? The thing about people in a small town that make them sit around and listen to scanners for what's going on in the neighborhood, it breeds this connectedness. And that connectedness is a huge benefit after there's a disaster. When they see a tornado go through, there's no hesitation to go help. Not just what do you need right now, but what are your needs for the future? And they continue to help. Somebody set up an account for Jackson down here at First National for barely expense. And when the statement come in, you know, it'd be like $10 or $50 or $300 yeah. or there was one on there for $2. And I looked at it and I squalled like a baby because I knew it was either a child or an older person that didn't have the money to help. That still tears me up to, to think about that. Were you able to pay everything with, with the account? And was it one of those? Wow. We, we did. You have a community that takes care of itself. You don't have to know the person that you're taking care of. And, and it's amazing. That feeling is the same, as silly as it seems, for water ballooning as it is the storm. Yeah, because so because it's it's about uniting the community. There's something as silly as that or, or or as insignificant as that can unite you and a storm can. Water ballooning was officially a go. So I got with Chief Smith and we mapped out an area, created a Facebook page, showed the safe areas to throw. So it is October eleventh. I'm working on the invite for Facebook to invite people to the water blowing event. I just drove in uh, early this morning back to Nashville from Cordova, which is city council meeting, got all that, all the details kind of ironed out and, um, to just kind of make things official. So I'm nervous about the event for two reasons. One, I'm nervous that no one will show up. And two, I'm nervous that way too many people will show up and it'll be more than the, uh, the police and the fire department there can handle, so here's hoping that everything goes well and people behave themselves so that we can keep doing this in the future. When we finally made the announcement, Murray Knuckles and Tony Paul Messerol went out and bought thousands of balloons with their own money. Yeah, I, I have about 5,500 balloons. Okay. <laughs> they spent days of their own time filling up these balloons to give away to kids on Halloween night. Since 2010 was the last year that water blending had happened in Cordova. So we got a generation that didn't really know what to expect. And if you show up with 50 water balloons, you're done in a matter of minutes and the night's over. There might be some kids down there that don't have any balloons to throw and they're making sure everybody has a good time. And I love that. In addition to the thousands that Tony Paul and Murray bought, Maple City Rubber out of Ohio donated balloons just for any kids that, that couldn't afford it so that everyone could, could enjoy it. Also, not really knowing how many people would show up or how many trucks would be there, I asked my nephew, Brett, if he'd be willing to pull a trailer through town so that the kids could ride on the back of. And he was happy to oblige. So we spent uh, an afternoon putting sheet metal and building the frame up on this trailer. And he brought a water tank, rigged up an electric sprayer so that they had a way to fight back against the fire department. It's easy for me to take credit for the success of that night because I'm there shooting video, but, but the truth is, without all these people who gave of themselves and of their time, none of this would have happened. There's gonna be an article running tomorrow. Okay. This is gonna announce that we're doing it again this year. Doing what again? Water ballooning on Halloween. Are we really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, yeah, so you should have told me a long time ago so I could get my balloons ready. I'm so excited about this. I mean, I was like a kid all over again. Called their mama and I said, Patty, I said, the kids are going with me on Halloween night. When I was telling uh, Paul about it, I said, How's that? how long is that going to last? And I said, ah, you know, a few hours. Now, Tanya, come on. He's like, there's going to be 500 balloons thrown and everybody's going to go home in 10 minutes. I said, oh, Paul, Stephanie has 500 water balloons. <laughs> I'm going to start now. I didn't know, I did not know this, that we were going to get to do this. I'm going to start now, like tomorrow. So when I'm trying to explain to Jason and Angela, I'm like, wear some warm clothes and your tennis shoes because you're probably going to get wet. You're probably going to get hit, you know, so don't be a pudding. I promise.
promise. You're going to have a time in your life. I want you to, to experience at this age something that I didn't get to. Mama didn't want me to get hurt. I want my kids to experience the Cordova that we experienced because what? They don't get that. Hey, me and my older buddies, we, we started texting each other. You know, and Josh, I text him. I said, man, you ain't going to believe what's going to happen. He said, you got to be kidding me. He said, why do you not let me know enough time to prepare to come up here? And I said, John, are you going to come throw some? No, nah, my arm's gone. <laughs> in fact, I've learned not to even ride through town because I know what's going to happen. <laughs> come throw balloons? I'll be a witness. <laughs> I don't know. I'll my, help them fill up the blue. I don't right? know if my throwing arm is good as it was back in those days. I'm so excited for Halloween, Amy. <laughs> okay, all right. So, what time is it? Three fifty-four. It's three fifty-four. Halloween morning. Do you know where your kids are? Hopefully, um, filling water balloons because that's what we need yeah. to be doing. So. Uh, we got batteries charged for the most part, memory cards dumped, and uh, gonna try to sleep for a few hours before the festivities of the day start for us tomorrow. So, so what, what do you say to Cordova at pushing four in the morning? <laughs> Please show up tomorrow. <laughs> I'm way too tired to be having a conversation on camera. So I'm gonna go lay down. Roll time. Roll time. <laughs> My uh, daughter asked me a while ago, I just carried on with it, said, where are you going? I said, go over here, Dollar General, get me some balloons for that big bath. She said, you're joking. <laughs> I said, yeah, I am. I won't, I won't be involved in that tonight. Yes. I ordered this off eBay two days ago. It's uh, the, the custom uh, cashmere water protection. Uh, I, I believe it will make me victorious tonight. Has that got a waterproof case on that thing already? Not yet. Man, y'all are gutsy guys. <laughs> Is everybody seeing the T-Rex? <laughs> Come on, T-Rex, let's take a run. <laughs> Don't feel bad, buddy. Throw it again. <laughs> That's not a paper. I was telling those kids who come out that night, yeah. you know, they they were, at 30 minutes in, they were out of water. Water. And that's what I told them, I said, y'all a bunch of rookies, man, y'all don't know. <laughs> right at the beginning, I was like, I was dodging, and, and nobody was really throwing at me much because I was bringing them balloons. And I was walking back, and I, I don't I don't even know where it came from. And somebody hit me right in the mouth. <laughs> and I was like, water went into my mouth. <laughs> I think some of the, the balloon, I was pulling it out of my teeth. I was like, man, am I bleeding? And I don't even know where it came from. Yeah. I was like, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. Get the fish.
So for the first time in years, water balloons flew in Cordova. No one was injured, nothing was damaged. Just like all those years before, it was just good, clean fun. When we got in the back of the, the wagon, I yeah. took one in the side of my head, and I, I ducked down. I was like, wow. All right, tough it, tough it. <laughs> Get back up. I'm like, that was one of my boys. <laughs> <laughs> and we keep patting up to it. Got in the back of that truck. Of course, my little boy didn't worn out because he's getting hammered, you know, and I was like, no, this is the way you do it. I said, if everybody gets in the street, it's not a water balloon battle. Then, you know, I said, you got to get in the back of this truck. And, you know, and that's why I was telling my little boy, it's like, we're in the back of the truck and we're looking this way. They, they're they coming up behind us. I said, that's just part of it. You're going to get hit. I was even trying to teach them how to turn around. I said, when you feel somebody's behind you, you don't just turn around and look because you're going to end up. I said, you put your arm up and you kind of turn around and you get ready. I said, there's strategy ways, to it. Ways to protect yourself. It'll get bigger next year because. People just didn't know, you know what I'm saying? They didn't know how much fun it was. Everybody was eager to... Well, I think the problem was everybody was scared to go and clear it with the the police, you know what I'm saying? But I think you, when you got that going and cleared that with them, then everybody opened up. And the police did a good job down here this time. Man, it was excellent. You know, people hitting their vehicle and they still wasn't fussing. But the best kudos for letting everybody goes to the fire department. Oh, my gosh, man. They were were horrible, man. Man, (laughs) It was like getting waterboarded, man. It was horrible. When I made Jason get off the truck, (laughs) I was like, he was so excited. He got to see exactly what it was about. I mean, it just blew their little bitty minds. And you know, and every time they came around, I can hear them screaming and I can hear them laughing. (laughs) What did you expect it to be like that night? I expected it to be like just a couple of people. Not that many people, not the whole town, just a couple of people, not as many trucks and stuff, just in like a regular field throwing balloons. And did you have fun? Yes, it was awesome. Hey! My real first day, just, you know, just watching the kids. I had a ball last night. I, I, I just out doing something. I haven't had that much fun, and I can't even remember. Uh, just from the time we get out there. What do I hope for over in the future? Good leadership, that they have a plan that everyone can buy into. I hope that the people in this town continue to have patience. Our mayor and our, our people in our town can only do so much. Are we ever going to be a big place that has 12, 15,000 people, maybe, but it's not going to be anytime soon. Cordova will be very fortunate to ever have a, a downtown like we knew it. It won't be in the near future. The groundwork has been laid for progress, but it's going to take a willingness to change. I don't want it to change too much. Here, everybody knows you, and everybody knows if something's wrong, they're going to come and say, hey, you need some help. Or yeah. It's kind of understood that it's never going to be the same as it was. You're also never going to change it from what it was. Mm-mm. You're right. Well, I'd like to see more businesses open up in Cordova and make it a city again. But, you know, those days could be over. The long-term impact of what those tornadoes meant to Cordova, it didn't set in with me for years. We were just in the mode of, hey, here's the position we're in. Let's recover, right? Let's get... Let's get the rest of the buildings torn down. Let's get our grocery store back. Well, let's get whatever grant funding we can and let's start getting buildings back online. And then we got exactly to where we needed to be. We got you know, the economic cornerstone with the grocery store done. We got the city hall, the police station, the fire station, we got all that back. And then you're just kind of like, all right, now what? What has this really done to us? Um, and still, I think still every day it sets in a little more and more. But, but to see what the way it looks today is pretty remarkable and what's going on up there. You know, the easiest thing to do is just shut the sucker down. You know, we, we, we're out of here. You know, there's nothing left downtown. Let's just, uh, let's just forget about it. We'll just become Walker County and we're just going to move on. But I, it's very refreshing to see that uh, resolve to stay strong and to stay Cordova. So I'm proud of where we are. Uh, we've come a long way from that day, but you're still just, it's hard not to stare at what you're not getting done. The resources are limited in a city like this. What do you think it would take, you know, to get it to that point where you do see that growth and attract people here? It becomes the, the chicken or the egg. 
What comes first? Do the families come and live here before a business builds? Or do you have to have the business before the family builds? And I don't know what the chicken or the egg is. This would be a real cheap place to to raise your family. We've got good schools, good athletic programs with the school. I mean, obviously our proximity to the most populated area in the state. I mean, we're in the Birmingham metropolitan area. It's grown in every direction except for ours. It's coming this way. As uh, the younger generation grows up, starts families and, and want to build a house, it's a lot cheaper place to do it this way than it is any other direction of Birmingham. This could be the, the, the best little bedroom community so I think that's the only future we got because there's just there's not enough people here right now for somebody to come in here and try to build a little store. There's a story to be told there about a place to live, yeah. but there's also exactly what you and I know, the outsider's eye when you come here. You're a poverty-stricken city with 2,000 people, and probably half those people are below the poverty line, if not more. Yeah. You can attract business. We've tried to build foundationally what we can. Uh, we have a strong police force. We have a very strong fire department. We're trying, now our focus is on parks and recreation. And how do we improve it? What we can't control is those economic dollars. We have people here that will operate small businesses that will sustain Cordova, but they can't build a building. And that's, that's the biggest thing that we lost. You can go to surrounding towns that are even smaller than us, Parrish or Oakman, they have buildings. I don't have buildings. If we can get that person to build, you know, three, four, five storefronts, yeah. that's that's the key. It'd be so nice if we could just replicate. Yeah. Just replicate a little bit of downtown. And I know it was old buildings and all, but I like old buildings. If it's just one, one building a year, one building every five years, because I miss Main Street as, as crappy and ugly <laughs> as it was, I miss it. You know, as citizens of Cordova, we just, we need to believe that we can. It's not that we can't, nothing's ever going to happen because with the nothing's ever going to happen attitude, that's what we'll have is nothing. Right. Yeah, it's a small town that has a lot of challenges. It had a lot of challenges before two tornadoes tore it up, and it's got a lot of challenges now. The buildings are gone, but the, the heart and the spirit of Cordova is still there. Wish the best for it. If I go out of state, I'll buy a lottery ticket. You know, I'm not a big gambler or anything, but if I ever win the lottery, I'm gonna rebuild Cordova. Yeah. <laughs> I set out to tell a story about water balloons, but the story I found was about community. A community that, truthfully, I didn't appreciate until I left. Cordova may never change, and you know that's okay, but it definitely changed me a lot over the past year. And maybe for the first time ever, Cordova feels like home. I'm not ready to pack up and move back just yet, but I've truly gained an appreciation for it that I never had growing up there. If I had found my place in Cordova, I might have never left. And if I had never left, I wouldn't have gone to college. I would have never met my wife. I wouldn't be who I am today. I definitely wouldn't have been given the opportunity to tell you this story. If feeling like an outsider was necessary for me to be who I am today, then I'm thankful for that. I wouldn't change a thing. I still believe community is who, not where. And if that's true, Cordova's right here with me in Nashville. I'll still always be a Blue Devil. I'm just so excited that, that it's happening again, and I hope that it just continues to go on. So uh, what's the plan? What do we suggest for next year? we we'll start buying balloons as soon as we get back. All right, we got to have some upset. Yeah, upset. All right. All right. Some upset. Can I say on record, man? Yeah. I'm sorry for those pe those garbage cans we stole at Crestview Heights to fill up water balloons in. Did you get caught with that or no. something? <laughs> <laughs> but we would go through Crestview Heights. You stole their garbage but cans. We steal some garbage cans every year to put water balloons in. <laughs>
Somebody probably went to their grave cursing whoever this was, you know. Medley kids. I love that, that you couldn't, like, yeah. the guilt got the best yeah. of you here, didn't yeah. it? Please forgive me and others. <laughs>